All right, I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, people will come and go as they please. And the first couple slides are boring anyway because they're about me, uh, just because it's what I like to talk about. <laughs> so this is a hacking Postgres talk. Um, first, a little bit about myself. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Crunchy Data. I'm also a Postgres committer, major contributor. I, I hacked a lot on Role of Security and 9.5, Commonwealth Privileges, 8.4, Role System 8.3. I've also hacked on PLB SQL and PostGIS. Um, really quick mention for the United States Postgres Association. This is the recognized community nonprofit MPO for Postgres. So people should go check it out and follow us at PGUS. Uh, Postgres Open's coming up in September, uh, yet another year. It's the U.S. Postgres Community Conference, and I encourage everybody to check it out. Follow us at Postgres Open. We'll talk about that later, too. I think it'll come up. All right, first things first. Let's talk about the source tree. So when you're hacking Postgres, the first thing that you're going to be looking at is the, uh, the source tree. You kind of pop in and start looking around, right? So the, the top-level source directory doesn't look too interesting. It actually doesn't have that much in it. Um, it's not until you start getting into the SRC directory that things get really fun. So this first, uh, first set of option things in here, there's a config directory, which is for the config system. Um, it's not terribly interesting. You don't tend to need to hack in it. Uh, contrib is an area that people do end up hacking in, right? This is where all of the Postgres extensions live. Uh, it's called contrib for basically historical reasons, but these days it is what generates that contrib package that you see on your, uh, you know, on a, you know, from yum or from apt when you're installing Postgres, you'll see a contrib package. That's where that comes from, but it's really all of the extensions that come from, um, that come as, as included from uh, what we consider core. Uh, so this, all of the uh, items inside of the git, uh, Postgres git repo are kind of considered core Postgres. Uh, there's extensions that exist outside of core Postgres on various websites, PostGIS being a great example of, of an externally maintained uh, extension. Uh, we then have an SRC directory, and this is where things start to get interesting, right? So you have SRC backend. This is the actual backend code. This is the code that runs the backend server. Uh, that's actually where we're going to spend a lot of our time today. Um, there's also a bin directory. These are your user space utilities, things like PSQL, uh, pgdump, and itdb, et cetera. We have a place for common code. We have a place for um, common code that's uh, used in just the front end utilities. And then we have SRC include, uh, which is basically all the different header files. It's primarily back end stuff, but there's also other stuff in there. Uh, in particular, SRC include catalog is what defines all of the tables that go into the PG catalog schema, which is something that's particularly interesting uh, in the event that you're adding a new catalog, right? You're going to end up adding new header files in here. Um, as with uh, a lot of things, a lot of the way that you start working on Postgres or hacking on Postgres is that you look at an existing patch, right, and start hacking from there. And so that's um, a lot of times if you're looking at something that added a new catalog, you'll see modifications happening inside of this SRC include catalog uh, directory. We then have a, a few different interfaces. Um, it's mainly libpq uh, and ecpg. So something to be aware of is that there's actually two libpqs, right? There's a libpq that's installed for clients to use, and then the back end has a libpq as well. And that's, how the, that's what the back end uses to speak what we call the Postgres protocol. And we'll, we'll hit on that in a minute, too. We then have uh, SRCPL, which is the uh, procedural languages that are included with core. Uh, so this is um, PL, just PG, PLPGSQL, PLPerl, and PLPython, and Tickle. Uh, there's a number of other uh, languages out there, uh, stored procedures that you can have. Those stored procedures are available as extensions typically. It's one of the great things about Postgres is that it's very extensible. So you can extend it um, by using extensions and creating your own stored procedures, for example. Uh, we have a port directory, which is all the uh, platform-specific hacks that we end up having to deal with across all the various platforms we support, which is quite a few. Uh, we then have a regression test suite. If you're interested in regression tests, uh, coverage.postgresql.org is a thing where we actually list what our regression test results look like in terms of code coverage. Um, so I certainly encourage people to take a look at that. We pulled down uh, time zone code from IANA. That goes into SRC time zone. And then I think the last one was the utils directory. Um, but it's just general utilities for a call. We then go into 
the actual backend directory. So this is SRC backend. This is where all the code that runs the actual Postgres backend exists. These are split out into some interesting areas. Access is one of the more interesting ones if you're working with indexes, right? Uh, so indexes are defined through what we call access methods, and those access methods are how we work with indexes, right? Um, and the, all, so all of the, that was cute, sorry. <laughs> Apparently using the clicker doesn't count, I don't know. Uh, so that's where everything like uh, B-tree indexes, gist, gin, things like that exist under that um, access directory um, and are implemented through access methods. Uh, we have a bootstrap directory, which is uh, essentially being run by initDB to bootstrap things to get things started. Uh, so we have an initial catalog of, of stuff to work from um, when you start, you know, in order to start the database, in order to be able to run, create table, things like that. Uh, we have catalog and commands. Uh, these are kind of interesting because the catalog directory is kind of defined as being what the you know routines that are used for modifying objects in the Postgres catalog. But then we have a whole bunch of stuff in commands that modify stuff in the <laughs> PG catalog. So in terms of what exactly that split is, I feel like most of the time things that are in catalog are things that are kind of more internal, right? Commands are routines that are backing things like create table statements, right? Or alter table or create index, right? Those are kind of more uh, directly facing. Uh, things in catalog are like uh, create, uh, constraints, like defining uh, constraints, for example. Uh, end up in catalog. So if you're looking for something, right, you want to know what implements create table, right, you probably would start in commands. Um, that's what I tend to do uh, in SRC backend commands, and that's where you'll find things like define relation inside of uh, table commands.c. It goes through all the steps to actually create a new, uh, a new Postgres relation with the create table command. We then have an executor. The executor is what actually runs queries, right? So if you ever do something like an explain plan, and you see all these different types of uh, nodes, right, that exist inside of the explain plan, the code that is actually run for all of those is inside of the executor, right? So if you see like a hash join, right, or, or um, uh, a merge join, or anything along those lines, a, a sequential scan, all of those exist inside of the executor, um, and they tend to be named after uh, what they do, right? Uh, so you'll see, you know, exec this and exec that, and those are the actual uh, processes that get run whenever we run something from the executor. We then have uh, foreign, um, which is actually a relatively small uh, bit of code. It's basically handling uh, getting information about foreign data wrappers and user mappings and, and servers, things like that, uh, in the back end. Uh, a lot of the more interesting code, if you want to see how something like the Postgres FDW works, that would be in contrib, right? Because that's considered an extension. That would be inside of contrib Postgres SQL or Postgres FDW. Uh, most recently, we have a JIT directory. The, the JIT directory is actually provider independent just in time uh, compilation infrastructure. So just in time compilation can be done by multiple providers potentially. This is the code that's provider independent from that. Um, so things that are specific to a particular provider wouldn't go in there. We have a lib directory, which is kind of what you'd expect. That's basically the code that is, uh, could be useful in uh, multiple different areas of the back end. Uh, and then as mentioned before, we have libpq, which is the back end code for actually talking that wire protocol. Uh, main's pretty, pretty straightforward, but one thing to realize with main is that Postgres can be started in a number of different ways, uh, and that really impacts how processing works inside of the back end. You have things like a single user mode, for example, and that's all controlled by when being run under main. We then have nodes. So uh, things like that plan tree, the executor tree, things like that are, are node trees, right? And we have a bunch of code for dealing with node structures inside of Postgres. Uh, so whenever you're defining some new node, you have to go in here and add functions for copying nodes, add uh, functions for comparing nodes, uh, things like that, so that when we do things like do a deep node uh, copy, we can copy the whole tree, for example. All of that requires uh, specific code, and that code is, exists inside of SRC backend nodes. Optimizer is an interesting one because it's actually both the optimizer and the planner uh, kind of together, right? So whenever we're uh, working inside of the optimizer, or working to generate a plan, like you run select and we're going to generate a plan for you, well, 
all the code that actually does that is in the optimizer, right? First thing we do is go through and parse it, but after we've parsed it, we go into the optimizer, and the optimizer is what spits out a plan that then goes to the executor. Uh, you can see there the parser is next. We'll talk a lot more about the parser here in a minute. But this is what defines the grammar that Postgres understands, right? So we have a lecture and, and an actual grammar in there uh, that are used to understand things like a, a create table statement or an alter table statement or a select statement. All of these things are defined through our grammar and inside of that parser directory. Uh, we have some common code for partitioning. This is the declarative partitioning that was added uh, recently in Postgres. Um, so that's inside of the partition directory. We have translations of backend messages to other languages. That's pretty straightforward. And then a bunch of backend hacks. We then have part two of the backend code. Uh, directory. We have the postmaster. So if you, you know, main is what starts things, right? But then we run this postmaster process. The postmaster process is what's always running, waiting to accept new connections that come in. And as those new connections come in, it spawns off and those new backends go and do whatever it is that uh, is being asked for um, through the traffic cop. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we have a regex library. Uh, this is Henry Spencer's regex library, although we kind of more or less maintain it nowadays, in my opinion. Uh, I know the Tickle community ends up taking stuff that we put into this in terms of changes. We have a replication uh, director that handles all of wall shipping and reading of wall logs. So this is for streaming replication, essentially. Uh, the rewrite engine, uh, this is used by roles, and it's also used by role-level security. So when you define a policy on a table, right, that policy has like a, a, a conditional inside of it, a where clause essentially that gets added. When you run a query and that query touches on one of these tables that has row level security, that in, uh, gets run through the rewrite system to take that query and rewrite it to include those conditionals. And that's how row level security is implemented in the back end. We then have snowball stemming. Uh, this is used for uh, full text search. Um, so basically, whenever you have words, you want to stem them so that you can have you don't have to worry about adjectives, uh, or, or add-ons, rather, I should say, to the end of uh, words or even to suffixes and whatnot. That's all done by the Snowball Stemming Library. Uh, statistics is also relatively new. This is the create uh, statistics command for the extended statistics. So Postgres has had statistics for a long time, but they were all always based on this notion of complete independence, right? Um, the create extend, uh, statistics system that was added extends that, right? Adds a new catalog and adds the ability to track information across multiple columns, which allows for correlation and allows us to do better query uh, planning with it, although you have to go define that yourself. We don't collect stats for all possible correlations because it would just be an explosion of information. Uh, the traffic cop is where things kind of sit to begin with, right? So when Postgres starts up, it has the postmaster, right? And then you have a connection come in, the postmaster spawns off a new backend process, and that backend process then goes into the traffic cop that this is what Postgres will be sitting in most of the time, right? We're just going to wait for something to happen. We're waiting for somebody to, to issue us a query to do something, right? So when something comes into the traffic cop, that's when it then gets, uh, goes through parse uh, analysis, and then it goes into the planner, and then it goes, uh, gets optimized in the planner, and then we go to the executor and get the results. That's all kind of that top level is all the traffic cop that handles all of that. Uh, we then have T-Search itself, which is the full text search engine, and we have utils, which is basically various back-end utilities, um, things like caching, some memory management, things in there. All right, so quick rundown of the Postgres back-end. I know we went kind of quick, but this is a, a relatively short uh, time period we have. So let's start talking about you want to change something in Postgres, right? You have some idea that you want like a new backend command or you want to add something to PG Bench possibly or you know you have to really kind of figure out what is it you want to hack on what is it you want to work on inside of Postgres maybe you're looking to improve performance or add a new authentication method um, or add another encryption library possibly so what we're going to talk about here is changing how an existing backend command uh, works right that's what we're going to discuss so when you want to think about changing an existing backend command, the question becomes, well, where do you start, right? How do you figure out what part of the source tree? Because ultimately, you're going to end up having to change a bunch of different pieces. Where I like to, to start tends to be the grammar, right? If I'm changing some existing command or I want to add a new command, the first thing I need to do is figure out what the user interface for that's going to be. 
Um, this isn't set in stone, but it's always a good idea, I think, to have an idea about how is the interface going to work for this. Um, it also ends up driving a lot of the rest of the code, in my opinion, and it's one of the hardest things to get agreement on. Uh, and sometimes you have to kind of say, okay, maybe we won't agree on this right now because not enough of the rest of the code is written, right? And that's fair, but you've got to start somewhere, and I find that becomes, uh, be, you know, it's a good place to go. So where is the grammar, right? The grammar is defined in the parser, right? And that's in that SRC backend uh, parse. So when we're talking about uh, a parser versus a grammar, what's the difference, right? Well, the parser really consists of two pieces. There's the lexer itself, which goes through and splits up um, what the input is into a bunch of different tokens, right? It, it actually tokenizes the input, and then you have the grammar, which defines how those tokens are allowed to go together, right? And what to do with them when they do come together, right? So while we're doing all of this parsing in the grammar, we're actually collecting up information about the command as well, right? And then once we've got kind of everything, every bit of information that's valid from that command that's useful, assuming the command parses, then we're going to pass that down to uh, a C function to actually run. And that's the function that's going to get called from the grammar to go do whatever it is that we need doing here. So, as I mentioned, it's in SRC backend parser. Inside of that, we have scan.l. This is the lexer. I typically recommend people don't mess with this. Um, the tokenization is, is complicated and is something that you don't necessarily need to change most of the time. I would say hardly ever does the tokenizer, uh, or the lexer, I should say, actually need to be changed uh, when defining new commands. So uh, what you're going to generally be looking at is gram.y, and we'll jump into gram.y here in a second. But uh, there's a couple other things in there. There's a few um, specialized routines for handling specialized parsing. Those go into uh, parse star.c. And then we have an analyze.c uh, and a scan sub, which is just support routines. Um, and then analyze transforms an actual raw parse tree into a query. Uh, and that's the query that goes through the, uh, the uh, planner and optimizer. All right, so when you're modifying the grammar, uh, the way grammar works inside of uh, uh, this type of a grammar, which is built using Bison, is that you have a set of productions, right? Um, the first production is the statement production. This is kind of like main for a C program, right? And from that, you have a list of all of the different top-level commands. And then you have a, a pipe, that's actually what that should be is a pipe, like these are down here, that says this or that. So here we have statement, and then we have things like alter event trigger statement, alter collation statement, alter database statement, and all the way down we have this copy statement, not all the way. This tends to be listed in alphabetical order, although ordering shouldn't matter here. Just uh, it's kind of notional. Uh, it's useful to keep it consistent. So as I'm going through here, I just want to point out, do ask questions as I go. Um, I realize I'm going through this at a pretty, pretty rapid pace, but I want everybody to please feel free to ask questions as we go along um, if you have them. So what we're going to hack on here is the copy statement itself. Right? So you have this top level statement that starts out with this STMT colon, and then we have copy statement. This copy statement is then defined as its own production. Right? So here we have a, a number of different uh, top-level copy productions, right? When you see something in caps like this, like copy, that is an actual token, right? Tokens have to be defined up in front, but this is an actual token that basically says when these four letters all go together, that's a token, right? And that token is copy. And here we have a number of options here, you have whether it's binary, what the qualified name is, um, optional column list, whether or not OID should be included, um, copy from, whether it's a copy from or copy to, if there's a program definition, file name, copy delimiter, with, and copy options. So this is one option for that top level command. This is another option for that top level copy command, right? And you can see that through this or statement here. So one of these will match whatever the rest of the, the query string ends up being. The difference here is that this preparable statement is when you're doing a copy from a query, right? So this one is for copying from a table, this one's for copying from a query. And it's important to realize that you don't want to have any uh, conflicts, right? You can have uh, what are called shift-reduce or reduce-reduce conflicts inside of your uh, parser. If you get that, 
that's bad. That means there's something that's not uh, clear in your grammar, right? There's some ambiguity in your, in your grammar definition, and you'll need to resolve that one way or the other. Uh, one way of resolving that is by going in and defining a bunch of new keywords, which we don't recommend, right? We want to minimize the amount of keywords that are defined. Uh, in Postgres, in the, in the grammar, there are different levels of keywords, so that's something to be aware of. Um, but typically, you want to try to avoid them if you can. Right? So the reason that this ends up working out OK is because we have these uh, single, uh, these open paren, close parens here right? that make this no longer um, ambiguous. Right? When we see an open parenthesis, we know you must be down in here because these ones up here don't accept that right? as, a, as a start. Um, so that's how we can avoid that ambiguity in this particular case. But it's just something to be aware of when you're defining your own. So each one of these, you know, if we look at things like op binary, qualified name, et cetera, these ones that are not in all caps are their own productions, right? And here's what some of those look like. And so here we have copy from is a great example. It can be either copy from or copy to, right? And here we start to see a little bit of what the code looks like. Okay, inside of the parser. So this dollar dollar is an indication of what the current node is, right? This is what this current thing is going to return. And here this is going to return either true or false. And copy from is actually defined as a production that can return one of those values, right? This is a Boolean return that's going to be defined higher up in the parser. And so you know that this is that kind of node, and that kind of node can either be true or false, and depending on what the uh, actual statement says that's what gets defined. Once that gets defined there and returned up, right, you'll see here in a second that there's a bit of code underneath each of one of these copy productions that puts the rest of it all together, right? So here we have whether there's a program, what the, and then there's a copy file name that has an option. It can be either standard in, standard out, or a string constant, right? So if it's a, a standard and standard out, we just get null here. Otherwise, we pass back whatever that string constant production itself is. Right? So again, this goes down to yet another level. Um, and there isn't any particular limit to the number of levels these things can have. Just be aware that it gets more complicated the farther you go. We then have a copy options, which gives us this copy opt list and then a copy generic opt list. We then have, and this is what allows us to look at uh, multi-value production. So in the event that you have uh, something that you, know, you want to have open parenthesis, x, comma, y, comma, b, uh, whatever, that's something where you would generate a list like this. So here we have a list make, and then we have this append, right? So the first one is this, and then we have this or statement, right? So this is going to start the list, and then whenever we have a comma, it's just going to keep adding and adding and adding. So one thing I haven't talked about a little yet is what the dollar number means. So the dollar number one here means the first item. And here you see we have dollar one and dollar three. That's because we have the first item and the third item. So a constant like this comma here also counts. Right? And you could actually reference it if you want, but it's not very interesting typically. Right? It's just a, a constant there. So what you're going to want to have is, are these references here. And this is how we're going to build this up and append uh, to this list. So that's what a multi-value production would look like. Uh, we then have default elements that are defined here, um, or defined elements with copy generic optarg. And here you can see $1, $2, and we have an at one. Uh, the at one is the line number, as I recall. Uh, so that's the informational stuff that can be passed back to let uh, the caller know when there's a parse error where it's at. Um, Line number or character number. So copy generic opt option. So this shows how we can define these different nodes, right? And this you're seeing is starting to become more C-like, right? So this, because this is defined as returning a node, copy generic opt arg, we can have it just be these different types of nodes. And every time you have a node like this, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that node has an identifier of what kind of node it is. So that's, we can actually check uh, we have like a, what's called an is a command, right? That says, is it this? Is it that? What have you? And we can test for that later on. That's what we'll do. All right. Whew. So, we have, you know, I talked a little bit, I think, through most of this. Um, what this all ends up doing is it all ends up getting built out into what's called gram.c. 
Uh, typically not something you have to worry about um, is gram.c itself. That's just built from this. But that's where you can actually go look at everything that ends up being defined through the parser. Uh, I think I talked through all of this. Any questions about any of that? Nobody has any questions about that? All right, let's move on. I'm running out of time already, I feel like. Okay, so here we have a, a, the production for all of the copy options. We have binary, OIDs, freeze. And the idea here is that we're going to add a new one, right? So this new uh, item that we're going to add to the copy command is called compressed. So we're just going to add this in, right? We do need to make sure that we update the list of tokens and keywords, right? That's in kwlist.h. And we have to add this to the list of unreserved keywords. So adding things to unreserved keywords is generally OK. Right? What you want to avoid is adding things to any of the reserved keyword productions. Um, because those then mean that you can't do things like use that as a column name, for example. And you want to avoid that. And here we can just define this new um, option here called compressed. And here we can make this a node. It's going to be an integer. It says true uh, for this particular value. And we're just going to create this um, element that will get passed back up through the list of productions. Right? So that's kind of to the parser side of things. Once you've done that, we have to go actually modify the copy command itself. Okay? So the definition for how the copy command works is in that commands directory inside of copy.c. And there's actually a function called process copy options, right? And then there's a, a state data structure inside of copy, which tracks all of the options that have been passed into the copy command. Um, that structure exists only inside of copy.c, not inside of a .h, because it's only used by the copy command. Um, when you are defining a structure in a .c file, you should put it near the top. Uh, I will point that out. So we're going to add a new item to this copy state data called compressed, it's a Boolean, whether it's a compressed file that we're working with or not. All right, and then we have to go handle inside of process copy options the code to deal with that. So C state is that structure that we just added this to, right? Um, we initialize that structure to all be zeros at the beginning of this, and then we say, okay, if C state compressed has already been passed in, we throw this error thing, conflicting or redundant options. And this, just so you understand, this has got a lot of different pieces to it that I'm going to try to explain because this starts to get into some real Postgres specific things, right? E-report is how you would report something back to the user, okay? What uh, log level you're reporting is this, right? So this can be an error, it can be a notice, it can be a panic. Hopefully we don't, <laughs> I don't think many people in here are going to be introducing too many new ones of those. Um, so what you have to understand, though, is that when you call e-report with error level or higher, it's going to actually handle doing a lot of cleanup for you. Okay, um, you're going to pass back an error code here, right? So this comes out of the uh, SQL error codes that we have defined, and then we're going to pass back an error message for the user. But we don't have to do anything beyond this, right? Once we call this e-report with error or higher. Postgres is going to log the message, send a message to the user saying it was errored, and then long jump out of this code direct, um, completely. Right? We're going to long jump all the way out to the beginning of, um, basically all the way back up to the top, and we're going to release everything, all the memory that was allocated, anything else that was handled at the time um, that this was all running, and get it back to a, a clean state at the top. Okay? So it'll also mark the transaction has failed if there was a transaction running. Right? That transaction will be marked as failed, and that's when if you're inside of a, you know, you do a begin, and you start working, and you get one of these, you have to either roll back to a save point or roll back the whole transaction, right? And then everything gets cleaned up. So that's all that happens inside of that e-report, which is why you see here we don't have any kind of return out of here. We don't need it, right? This is one of the things about hacking on Postgres that's different from some other systems. So what you see here is if we have libc defined and C state compressed hasn't already been set, then we can say, OK, we're going to set this value based on whatever that value was that got passed in. So we're going to get the Boolean out of that um, uh, definition that was passed in. And then we have this pound else clause that says, basically, if we weren't built with Zlib support, we're just going to throw an error right then. So any questions about kind of how that, that stuff works? I realize it's a little bit crazy. I don't know. I always thought it crazy when I first looked at it. 
No questions about any of that. All right, so is that it? No, right? We have a lot more that actually had to be done to add this in. Um, so when hacking on this code, what I was doing was I ended up changing um, and ending up having to track these what are called GZ files, right? So inside of things like fd.c or fd.h, we actually, and fd.c, we actually keep track of all the file descriptors that are opened by Postgres, right? Um, and Postgres has a mechanism for keeping track of them and then getting rid of the ones that aren't needed anymore, et cetera, just to avoid having to be constantly reopening them. Uh, but those were all done as file stars, and I had to go add in this GZ file because that's how the, the libz, you know, glibc or gzip um, library works. And you, in order to read and write from those, you have to use these gz read and gz write functions, so I had to go make some uh, hacks there to deal with that, update the documentation, which um, it says HTML, it's not really, but not today anymore. But you have this doc src HTML ref copy um, that you have to modify. Then we have to also add in regression tests, right? So this is what the, the diff stat from all of that looked like. Right here are the regression inputs and outputs. Uh, I didn't go too much into the regressions, but we can talk more about that if people have questions. But you basically define inside of the regression test things to run, and then you compare the output of that um, and to what was expected. When you have an input and an output, that's where you actually get to generate something uh, to compare to. All right, any questions about that? So that's kind of the basics for writing this one patch. Um, now I'm gonna talk more generically about bits and pieces inside of Postgres. So Postgres has a number of different subsystems that already exist, right? These are things that you typically don't have to deal with. The first big one is memory management. Um, and we're gonna talk through that in just a minute, but we'll also talk about error logging and clean up a little bit more the way we have some linked lists, catalog up nodes, uh, datums, and tuples. So the first one on this is uh, memory management. So whenever you allocate memory in Postgres, you, in the back end at least, you want to be using what's called PALIC, okay? So this PALIC routine is very similar to a malloc, except that we keep track of what memory context you are currently in, right? So the memory context is hierarchical. So each query, for example, has a memory context, but then we also have a memory context for each tuple, right? So when we're processing a tuple, we work inside of a, a memory context that's a, appropriate for that tuple. And then when we're done processing a tuple, what we do is we just throw away the entire tuple memory context, right? We have, as I mentioned before, this per query context. So this is when we do that e-report, right, at an error level or higher and we jump out, we're gonna throw away everything that happened to be associated with that query context. And that will then throw away anything that was below it. Like I said, it's hierarchical. And it's kind of neat. Recently we, um, well recently, and maybe it been two or three years ago now, but there was, uh, there's a way you can actually have hooks inside of memory contexts. So you can basically say, when this memory context goes away, call me, right? Because that memory context, you may have other stuff that you were allocating or file descriptors or things like that that you need to get rid of. Uh, if you're working inside of an extension, for example. And so that hook can then be called and go do other work. We then also have a top memory context. So this is what lasts the entire lifetime of the back end. So if you're operating in the top memory context, you need to be sure that whatever you're allocating is either going to definitely be allocated later, even it, or deallocated, I should say, later, um, in the event that maybe you, even in an error case, right? because e-report error isn't going to deallocate this for you because it's top memory context. So you have to be very cognizant of that. And then we have whatever the current memory context is. So that's what PALIC will, will actually uh, use for new allocations. Uh, we do also have an explicit allocation ability to, we have a function where you can explicitly allocate memory inside of a given memory context or from a given memory context, I should say, uh, if necessary. But generally what you wanna be doing is use PALIC for any kind of routine allocations that you're doing, as long as you're not inside of some kind of loop, right? Um, and you can typically expect that you don't have to worry about doing the cleanup, right? It's very convenient that way. And you also don't have to worry about doing cleanup in the event of like an e-report being thrown. So when we talk about errors, right? Um, if you have, are introducing something that's like a, an internal can't happen kind of case, you can use e-log, although we typically discourage it, right? What we tend to encourage people to use is e-report because that's gonna be something that will be well-formed and passed back properly uh, to the client side. 
Uh, so you don't ever want to use it where you might have a user seeing it, but it could be useful for like debugging. We do also have asserts. Um, of course, asserts are only run in assert enabled builds. So you don't want to be putting asserts in place where it's something that a user could do and it might cause an issue, right? A search should be only used for making sure that other developers who are hacking on it are properly using your functions, right? That way, if uh, some other developer is hacking something new and they try calling your function improperly, that's a good place for an assert. Uh, you do need to be careful that you don't end up in situations where because an assert is in place, it ends up causing the system to act differently. Uh, that's something to always be wary about and always be thinking about when you're working with, uh, with asserts. If you think it's something that could happen in a production environment, you should probably be using e-log or e-report. So as mentioned before, when you're using e-report, you want to use it with error code and error message. We have a style guideline uh, that you want to make sure that you look at and, and follow whenever you're uh, passing information back to the user. And the style, style guideline is is there for a number of reasons. One of them is just to be consistent, but also because in, we try to make it easier for translators as well, right? It's something to always be thinking about for us because we have so many different languages that Postgres is translated into. We want to make sure that it can be well understood in those different languages. So try to follow the style guide. I mentioned this already with the e-report uh, error, error or higher. So if you do an e-report with like a notice or a log, those are not going to be um, passed back to the user, right? They'll go into like the, the log or whatever, but they're not things that end up getting passed back to the user, or sorry, they don't fail the transaction. Notices by default do get passed back to the user. But code execution will continue in that case, right? If it's, if it's something that's lower than an error. Uh, you can also throw warnings in here, although they tend to be pretty rare. Uh, we don't tend to use warning very much, which is probably for the best. Any questions about handling that? All right. We then have uh, the syscache uh, and, sy and working with system catalogs. So whenever you need to get some bit of information from a system catalog, you're probably going to be using uh, search syscache, right? And that allows you to look something up inside of a catalog based on some key. Uh, we have helper routines that allow you to do that pretty straightforward. You can use up to four keys. You do need to make sure you release the syscache when you're done with a tuple, right? That releases it back uh, to the system so that, and we actually have code that will complain if you don't. Um, and we have some additional convenience routines in else syscache. Um, generally, look for existing routines. I mean, this applies across everything. Look for things that are already there. We'll talk some about what they're, what some of the other options, some of the other subsystems are in a minute, but you want to use these subsystems, try to avoid defining your own or going and recreating things. We talked a little bit about the node system earlier, but it's essentially we have these expression trees that are comprised of nodes, and each node has this data type which allows you to say, okay, what kind of a node is this thing that I've been given? You can create these nodes using make node and passing in whatever that type is, we principally use this in the grammar. Um, it is also used in some other places, but mainly it's in the grammar. One of the things to be always aware of and careful of is that when you're resolving something like a table name, right, and you want to get to an OID, there's specific routines for doing that in a way that is safe. And you want to make sure that you're using those routines. Uh, if you're not, then you can end up with uh, potential raise conditions and whatnot. Uh, there's some very complicated code written to address that. Um, so you want to avoid trying to do that uh, late in the, uh, in the system, right? You want to handle all of that up front in the parser or as, as early on as you can. Datums in Postgres are, are general structures uh, for a given value. Um, we have a lot of helper routines for different types of datums. We have in32s. Um, we also have a huge variety of other ones. One of the things to be aware of with datums, though, is that they can be out of line, which is known as toasted. Uh, if you're not familiar with Toast, it's the, um, I forget. Basically, it's how we deal, I, I can't, I can never remember the whole acronym for Toast. The oversized attribute storage technique, whatever. <laughs> blame, blame Jan. Um, that, that was definitely an acronym that was designed after we decided what the name was. Um, but essentially, the, the way that it works is that this is stuff that's stored out of line. It's things that are over a certain size that we can't store directly on a page. Those will be stored out of line and can be up to a gigabyte. But we try to minimize the 
uh, cases where we actually have to go pull that whole gigabyte size thing into memory or potentially gigabyte size. Um, so just be aware that these datums, the, the variable length ones, can possibly be stored out of line. And you have to check for that in some cases. Uh, tuples are, are rows, right? We comprise them of datums. You can go to see what they're defined, uh, what a heap tuple looks like in htoop.h. Uh, we have a couple different varieties of uh, tuple um, things, right? Sometimes there can be a pointer to a disk buffer. Sometimes it can be empty. Um, it can also be a, a single pallet chunk. And then there can also be cases where it's separately allocated. And we also have what's called this minimal tuple structure. This is where we've kind of pulled out everything that we don't need. Things like uh, hash joins uh, can end up using those because we just pull out what the key is and we don't care about the rest. More information about tuples, number of attributes, um, different flags that exist. Uh, as with a lot of things in Postgres, the information comes uh, about something, you know, we'll have like a struct, and then what we'll have is the actual data come immediately following that struct, right? Um, that's something that I think we've started to use. Uh, well, first of all, use the macros, right? We have lots of macros that are there uh, for doing that. But these kind of variable length structures um, are things that you have to be aware of and watch out for uh, when you're hacking in Postgres. Just be aware of that's how they work, right? I think, I don't know if we've ever gone back through and redefined all of them using the, the standard way of doing that, because there is actually a way to define variable length, tuple, variable length structures now in Z. Well, I say now. I say we use it now. It's been there for a long time. All right, other subsystems. We have a whole bunch of other things. Um, if you're writing generalized code, that should go in the SRC backend lib. Always look for existing code because we've tried to make it portable. We've tested it. We have regression tests. You don't have to write as much code. Some of those include things like the linked list implementation. We have uh, the binary heap. We have uh, just all, all of these, right? Bloom filters, knapstack problem solvers, red black binary trees. Like, these are all things that have already been written. You don't have to go write them again, right? So if you're looking for something that works in a manner along these lines, go try to find them and use them. All right. Then we get into actually working with the community and how things work, right? So PGSQL Hackers is the primary mailing list. If you aren't already on it, you should go to postgresql.org slash account, get yourself a postgres.org account, and then you can subscribe using lists.postgresql.org. Uh, you definitely want to discuss your idea and thoughts about how to improve Postgres first, right? Look for cases where people are working on similar capabilities. Uh, try to find ways of doing things in a general manner uh, rather than something specific. So what happened to this whole copy compress thing? Well, somebody went and wrote something called copy program instead. <laughs> and you can use copy program with Zcat or Gzip. It's not quite the same as working with copy compressed data because whenever you're actually transiting something over the wire, it's going to end up being uncompressed. Uh, but it's very similar, right? And because of that, it, we ended up going with this approach, which is not a bad way. And it also means we don't have to have direct Zlib support and all of that infrastructure that came with it, having to deal with GZ write and GZ read and dealing with things like that. So. It ended up being a good, a good solution that happened to be developed around the same time that I was hacking on this copy compressed idea. All right, whenever you're talking about code style with Postgres, you always want to try to make your code look like it fits in, right? Um, there is a, a style guide for the code in the developer fact, and always look out for copy paste errors. Be very careful if you're doing any kind of copy paste and that you go review everything. Uh, all of our comments are C style. We don't do any C++. Um, one of the things when writing comments is always you want to think about describing the why, right? Not the what or the how. We can read the code, right? What we want to know is why are you doing this, right? Why is this code operating in this way? What's the reasoning for it? Um, and definitely use big comment blocks. If you look into the Postgres code, and this is something I encourage everybody to do, go look at the code, you'll see that there's pages of comments sometimes for even just a few lines of code because it's explaining why it works this way, right? Why are we doing things in this order or this manner? And it's really important, and it's going to help you later on, right? When you come back to this code in a year or two, three years down the road, it's going to be a lot easier to come back to it and understand that if you've got a big comment block explaining how it works. And if you get to a point where the comment block isn't enough, create a readme file. So if you ever looked at the Postgres source tree, you'll notice that there are readme files inside of different directories that try to explain what that part of the code does, how it works, how it operates. 
Feel free to create your own as you go through and understand things. Make sure you read them. If you see issues with them, submit bug patches, right, uh, to fix those. So when it comes to submitting patches, um, we tend to prefer context diff, although we can argue about that. But um, generally, git diff is now accepted um, for hackers. Uh, we do ask that you put multiple patches inside of one email. We don't do things like the Linux kernel where you have like 50 emails that are all one email for one patch kind of thing. Whenever you email hackers, make sure you include a description of your patch, any regression tests, documentation updates. PG dump support is a big thing. Please try to include PG dump support, otherwise somebody else has to. And then register your patch here at this commitfest.postgreskill.org. This is where we track all of the patches that are going into Postgres in the next uh, round. And if you haven't heard yet, the plan, I believe, is that we're going to have a July commit fest this time around. So we'll start in July, and then we'll have one later on in September. Yes? Right, and yeah, things that run in the back end, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if there is something that is going on, say, in Postmaster that is a little harder to have more front end facing stuff, is there a way to test that? Well, like, are, are there regression tests that can touch things that are, that are going on in the Postmaster or figure out what's going on in a, sort of in a different back end or involve inter process communication of some sort? Um, there are two other yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the one other thing, the one, yeah, so the, the question was about testing. So Tom was just mentioning the isolation test. This is for the recording. Mentioned that we have an isolation test that allows you to run multiple things concurrently in the back end for testing isolation cases. We also have tap tests, um, which are basically Perl tap module tests. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that there are extensions, right? So we have uh, uh, extension tests. So that's something else that you might want to think about, right? If inside of SRC tests, I believe it's modules, uh, you can define your own extensions. Um, and some of those are just like test extensions, right? There's like a a test PG dump extension that goes and creates an extension just for the purposes of testing whether PG dump can dump that kind of extension correctly, right? So that might be something, and you can write your own extension that then can go run code in the back end and inspect stuff, right? And see what's going on in the back end, right? Um, testing the postmaster itself is a little bit tricky, right? I mean, you could try, if it's something you can reach through single user mode, maybe you could do that, but probably not, right? Um, so. In that kind of a case, I'd, I'd love to hear suggestions about how we could improve that, kind of, you know, make that more testable. But I don't have any great solutions offhand. Would be great to have more testing of wall replay. There is some. There is some, but but would be great to have more. Absolutely. I, I'm trying to remember where is it that we, where do we have the testing of the wall replay done? SRC uh, test. SRC test. SRC test recovery. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that would be, yeah, that would be a good area to start looking at to improve the test coverage of that. But that, that would definitely be great. That's something I think we could really 
really use. Um, I, I don't know that we have any, do we have anything specific for testing replication? That was the other one that I've been thinking about lately. Yeah. There is a replication thing for actually replaying wall. Okay. Yeah. The, the one thing to mention, of course, again, is coverage.postgresql.org, right? That that's where if you're looking to define new tests, I would go look there and see what's not being covered, um, and and try to go based on that, try to find new stuff, to, new ways to cover lines of code that aren't currently covered. Yes. So the Cree. Would it be able to see like the cardinality specifically from a hash join? Like we, because ATM sort of picks that out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I understand your point. Um, I don't think we have anything that tests that currently. I know the create statistics stuff. I think had some tests in it, but I don't know if it tested down to that level. But that's what I'll look at. The create statistics patch that went in recently. I think that was in the ten cycle. Um, that might have had some some tests around that. I know it had some tests. I was just not sure if it was only around the DDL portions or, or how much of it tested. I think there were some tests in there, but I don't. I mean, if you're looking for like testing that you got the exact correct answer from a particular, the expected one. Yeah, the expect the expected answer from a particular set of data. I'm not sure how down that goes. Uh, Tom, do you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can't have the cost estimates included in, in that output, which is why explain costs off exists, because that ends up being platform dependent. And generally speaking, Postgres doesn't have a whole lot of what I would consider unit tests, and that's kind of what you're getting at. it. That's kind of like more of a unit test. You want to test this exact function, to make sure that it returns exactly the right result. We don't have a whole lot of that. I think it would actually be something that would be good to add, but... I think, I think we would. Test modules, yeah. Just recently, I put in something specifically to exercise planners predicate test rules. Okay. Yeah, I would say the one thing you want to be thinking about when you're creating new regression tests is that you want to keep them as efficient as possible while getting as much code coverage as you can. Right. One thing that we frown upon is test coverage that takes ridiculous amounts of time to run because that impacts all the developers, everybody hacking on Postgres. So just something to be aware of. All right. Well, I'm, I'm well over time now, but thank you all. And feel free to come chat with me later on.